And uh, uh, the, the man talking said, you know, these archaeologists are usually atheists. They don't believe. If they see something they don't understand, they have to explain it away. Because, And, and I was just thinking about this morning how, how archaeologists are proving things that we already knew because we believe the Bible. That there were giants in the land. And those giants that were bigger than the children of Israel, that were bigger than little David, God gave them victory over the giants. Has anybody seen the Lord give you victory over your giants? Come on. Amen. I just was rejoicing in my heart to know. Amen. I feel sorry for people that don't have faith to know that God is with me in the valley. God is with me on the mountaintop. God is with me when the lions come, the bears come. Amen. He's with me when the giants come. Amen. And I can call on the name of the Lord and find rescue. I can find safety. I can find healing. Somebody said praise the Lord. Amen. This week I was listening to the scripture and the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, I believe it is, that, that they received the Holy Ghost where they were sitting. And I do believe that it is possible for us to receive a miraculous gift from God while the preacher preaches, while the singing is going on, while the, the, the presence of the Lord is moving. If we would all just open our heart and receive what the Lord is giving, I believe every one of us can leave here changed. Amen. I'd like us to pray for ourselves. Pray for yourself. Lord God, I want to be able to receive. Lord God, whatever you have for me, Lord, in this service. Lord, even in the beginning this prayer, Lord, in the, the next few songs, Lord God, uh, in the preaching of the Word of God, help my heart to be open. Help my mind to be open. Help my spirit to be open that I may receive that which you can impart to me. Lord, I pray for healing to take place in this service today. Lord, I pray for peace to be imparted in this service today. I pray, God, that you, oh Lord Jesus, would pour out some spiritual gift, Lord, in this service today. If there's some that has a, that yet have not received the gift of the Holy Ghost, that even while the preacher preaches, let the Holy Ghost fall on every one of us. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I want a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost, Lord God. I want you to help me to believe what you want to do. Help me to see what you're doing, Lord. I pray for a mighty work of the Holy Ghost. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. This, this morning we're going to give you an opportunity to give, amen. You know, we worship the Lord in many ways. We clap our hands, we raise our hands. Amen. In many ways we worship the Lord, but one of the ways we worship the Lord is we worship Him in our substance. Amen. Amen. It's, it's not all about money. Amen. In our lives, but you know, we do a whole lot of things about money. And one of the ways we demonstrate our submission and our love for the Lord is we worship Him and give Him our tithes and offerings. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you today for the people of God. Lord, we have found you to be our provider, that you have been the source of our blessing, Lord. And God, I have seen you, Lord, and people in this house today, I have seen you bless them. Miraculous blessing. Lord God, they have testified. Lord God, how you, you blessed them with food, blessed them with cars, blessed them with jobs. You, Lord, gave them blessings, Lord, they weren't expecting, Lord, and I know that it is a source, Lord, that you are pouring them out, Lord, blessings that can only come from you. I pray that even as they continue in their faithfulness, that you, oh God, would just blow their mind again. Lord Jesus, bless them as only you can. And everybody said in Jesus' name, let's stand together. Amen. And let's give us worship the Lord. Amen.
I'm, I'm so glad to see you. And it's such an honor to be here. I do love to preach. Uh, I don't know if I love to preach as much as your pastor loves to preach. Uh, he said he'd almost pay to preach. Uh, and he does. And God blesses him for it. And our congregation, you better keep appreciating if you don't appreciate it enough, folk will really, really love what Scott comes. Uh, they might run me off if I let him come several weeks in a row. Uh, but I, I love him. He's genuine. He's real. Uh, and as much as I can say good about him, Sister Phillips is even gooder. Amen. She is so awesome. And you are blessed here. Your church is blessed. Amen. You're blessed with an amazing amount of talent. You're blessed because you share your talent with our district and our, our movement. And I'm so thankful for that. Um, I, one thing I really love about Scott, Scott Phillips is kind of like the guy that went to the doctor. And uh, he said, Doc, listen, I want you to give it to me straight. I want you to talk to me in plain English. Don't use all that jargon I can't understand. But I want you to tell me in plain English what's wrong with you. Doc said, I'm not sure you do. He said, oh, yes, sir, I can take it to me. I want you to tell me in plain English. He said, okay, well, you ask for it. But in plain English, you, sir, are lazy. <laughs> yeah. Now, he said, okay, I can take it. Now, give me the medical terms so I can tell my wife. <laughs> I, I'm thankful that Brother Philip speaks in plain English. I like it. I've probably said this here before, and I'll probably say it here again. Uh, one of our elders in our church, he's not in good health now, but he is a preacher's friend. He sits over on the front row on the far end. In fact, that's one pew that it's actually walled out a little bit where he sits. And it's a, it's a bad pew, but Brother Howard is a preacher's friend. And he, he's behind you. He can't preach too long, too loud, too hard. Uh, he loves it. He's the reason we don't even have a clock on the back of our sanctuary wall anymore. I notice you have one. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he, he, he didn't like it. Somebody cut it short and then we missed something. And uh, he used to get up and sing when we did congregationals regularly. He'd sing, I will not be denied. He said, somebody misses church. I want my blessing and theirs too. Right. <laughs> we were getting ready to go on a men's outing one day. And we were under our pavilion. Got ready to load the bus. He said, Brother Jimmy, you know I'm not one to give a preacher advice. And uh, I was assistant pastor at that time. I said, no, sir, I don't know that you have. He said, well, I've got something for you today. I said, Brother Howard, y'all want it. He said, well, there's two things you ought to preach about every time you get behind that sacred desk. And I was ready to go home and write down notes. And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, first off is God. I don't have to write that down. I, I'm going to do that, but yes, sir. Uh, Brother Howard, I promise that I will never get up and preach and not preach about God. What's the second thing? He said, 20 minutes. <laughs> well, I can't say that I've always held his advice, but it has helped me keep messages short uh, because of that. So I want to I try to do that today, uh, preach about God, and hopefully not much longer than 20 minutes. What an excellent passage of scripture talking about God and his goodness. And I'm thankful that we serve a merciful God. Amen. If I ever get overwhelmed, I like to go back and read Psalm 136. Almost every verse in that chapter ends with where his mercy endures forever. And uh, sometimes when I fail, I reflect on our Bible heroes who failed God miserably. But when they repented, God forgave. Yes. Uh, some of our heroes, David, I don't know, there's probably not a single one of you that, that has committed all the sins that we know that David committed. Right. Yet, he's recorded in history as a man after God's own heart. And again, I'm just continuing the message that's already been preached since this service started. I joined my voice with your anointed worship team. And we started out saying there's one God, one name. We lift you higher. And that's where this passage started out. And, and, and Brother Phillips got up and told us that God will give you victory over your giants. The guy that wrote this knew that personally. Right. That God had done that. And he daily, that scripture says, loathes us. The uh, old King James Version is loathed. Uh, it, it just means he loads and keeps on loading. We would right. say loads. But I mean, he daily, daily loads us with benefits. If you're going around as a negative person, you are ignoring all of the good things that God has done for you. Yeah. 
Wow. I, I used to get tickled when I was a kid. We would be over here at the campground and working and driving. They used to have testimony hour on the radio. And there was one radio station that almost every person that called in would start this way. I thank the Lord this morning that he woke me up clothed and in my right mind. Yeah. I have never gone to bed worried that I was going to wake up a crazy day. <laughs> <laughs> but if we're thinking that way, we're more cognizant of the blessings of God. Uh, I don't want to step off in there now. I don't want to get in trouble here. But he's faithful. All my life he has been faithful. All my life, he's been so, so good. I could take an extra five minutes here and tell you about miracles he's done for us in this last year. Go ahead. Not yeah. just for us. He said, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you, I'm living in a house right now that I don't deserve. I've got land that I don't deserve right now. And I mean, in the middle of this time when everything is inflated and God gives us a blessing and we bought a house, 26 acres, a quote barn with living quarters and five restrooms and full kitchen, and all of this, and 26 acres and 22 RV spots, all for less than we could build the house. I'm telling you, God's good. Yeah. Amen. We've been looking for land to build on there since 1997. And finally, in October, found out we could buy some. And, and I talked to my wife about it. She said, you know what? That needs to go to Brother Ethan and Sister Lauren so they can build. And I said, are we sure? Is that what we want? If that's what you want. I like it, but I'm going to make sure you want it. We want it. And, and, and you bless somebody else, and God blesses you unbelievable. Just a couple of weeks ago, a family in our church, we had uh, some pledges that we uh, took up for this summer because we have extra things that happen because life happens. Yeah. And apostolic revival involves apostolic giving and sacrifice. Right. But there's this young couple, and they both turned in a pledge. She turned in a lot more than he did. She said, well, let's, let's give this amount. The day they gave that amount, the next day he goes into work and they offer him a promotion that he was hoping to get. But when they told him to pay, it was 18% higher than his highest hope of what the raise would be. You, you cannot give God. I'm not telling you that to, to try to get you to give, but I'm telling you, God daily loads us with benefits. And he don't have to hurt somebody else to bless you. But sometimes people bless the kingdom of God by not doing all they should. God finds other ways to put it in. He is so good. He's so faithful. I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. But the greatest goodness of God is exemplified when we confess our sins, like 1 John 1 and 9 tells us. And it lets us know he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't care how long you live. It's going to take repentance. Yeah. That's right. It's going to take consistent repentance. Right. And, but if we repent, God forgives. If you've never enjoyed this wonderful Pentecostal experience, today can be your day. Amen. If you'll repent, if you'll be baptized in the only name under heaven, Amen. among them whereby we must be saved, he will still fill people with his spirit. There's only one way right. in to the kingdom of God. There's not a multitude of ways. There's not a myriad of ways. You can't Brother Cheryl preached excellently the other night here. Uh, you can't just get on any road and get there. That's right. Uh, and, and there's only one way in. If you're not full of the Holy Ghost, I wouldn't leave here today till I was. Yes. Cain tried to get his way and he got him curses. Right. Uh, I don't want to just worship God. I want to worship him in the way he wants me to worship him. Yes. And he tried to cover up his sin and he was cursed by God. So don't try to cover up your sin. Right. Repent. Let God know. But thankfully, when we repent, he not only forgives, he removes our transgression as far as the east is from the west. You've probably heard this a million times, but I still love it. Amen. The accuracy of the Bible. Yes. If he had said north from the south, that would still be a long way. Right. But you're going to go so far north and you're going south again. Right. You're going to go so far south and you're going north again. Right. But you can go east and you circle the globe a million times and you're still going east. Amen. No one can say how far the east is from the west. Right. That's how far God wants to remove. Right. Uh, but I want you to notice that our text said he removed our sins. We can try to get rid of them. Yeah. We can forsake our sins. Right. But it takes God to remove our sins. Yeah. Amen. But in that same passage, 
It says that he made his ways known unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. And I've never really thought much about that verse until I ran across the verse in the book of Jude. In the midst of these wonderful verses reminding us not to forget all the benefits of God, he throws that verse in. And you know, you know your Bible. The children of Israel have been in a pattern of failing, yeah. repenting, and serving God. Right. And then God, for lack of a better word, punishes Moses and says, you're not going to be able to enter into the land of Canaan. So I wondered why God put this passage in that location when he's telling you to remember all the goodness of God. I've always felt a little sorry for Moses yeah. when I get to go into Canaan. It was the people of God doing wrong that made him mad enough to just disobey a little bit. Right. It wasn't a gross sin, it was just aggravation. Right. Uh, and so Deuteronomy 34, it says that Moses died in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And verse 6 says he buried him in the land of Moab over against Bethlehem. He's put in a pretty good location there. But I love this next line. He said, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. God buried Moses, and nobody knows where God buried him except the general location. Right. And Moses was 120 years old, and that's old to us. But to let us know he wasn't really old, the Bible says his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Uh, the living Bible says his eyesight was perfect, and he was strong as a young man. The message paraphrase says his eyesight was sharp, and he still walked with a spring in his step. Uh, though he was old in our perception, he didn't die from old age. It was because God said, it's time, Moses, for you to move on. Joshua's going to step in. And they took away the children of Israel uh, leader. And it's a very humbling story. But if you go back and read, when God told Moses, all right, Moses, I told you to speak to the rock. You spoke to the rock. You're not going in. Moses didn't get bitter. Moses didn't get angry. In fact, he doubled down on telling everybody, you're going to do what God says. Right. And, and you listen, and you're going to do great things, and you're going to go where God says you're going to go, and you're going to possess all of this, and you're going to do. And Moses was, he was faithful. Yeah. And, and concerning remembering sins, God says in Isaiah, I am he that blotted out thy sins, and thy transgression for my own sake, I will not remember thy sins. And, and, but God didn't let Moses go. And, and so that, that's always bothered me. Uh, in 1995, uh, I didn't go to General Conference that year, but they very well invited me and a friend of mine uh, to come down to his place. And he had a two-bedroom uh, apartment over his garage. And a couple of the girls about uh, to stayed in the house, and we stayed there. We went to Milton, Florida, which is right at Pensacola. And uh, me and another guy here from Jackson, we went out to the to the beach. And there was nobody out there. It was October. Um, we said we was gonna get out there. So we we took our shoes off. We rolled our blue jeans up a little bit, and, and we decided we was gonna go get in the water. So I took my wallet and I buried it in the sand under our shoes, so that when we came out we could get them. Well, we got out there and just had a great time, but we didn't realize they had. Supper ready at the house, and Brother Webb, we weren't back yet, so he sent those girls to come find us, and they did. They were, they were out there waving at us, and they were so kind that they even picked up our shoes and brought them to us when we came out of the water. Well, it was at least an hour before we got back to Milton because we searched and searched and searched. Uh, for where those shoes were so we could find that wallet. Oh, mercy. And we went to every spot we could think of. We dug, we could, we never found that wallet. Oh. I, I had my driver's license in there. I had my only debit card in there. I had $70 <laughs> in that wallet. Uh, <laughs> that was a lot of money in 1995 with Bible College right. And uh, Hans Paul was the guy with me. Now, thankfully, he owed me thirty dollars, and we was able to get back home. But you know, that's been twenty-seven years now, and I still haven't found that wallet. Wow! I never got a call saying, "Hey, we found a wallet with your driver's license in it." 
uh, I hope somebody found that seventy dollars and was blessed by it. But wouldn't it be great if I could bury my sins like that? And I couldn't find them no, no matter how hard I look for them. Mm. Jeremiah 31 says, They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, uh, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest uh, of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Chapter 50, he says, I will pardon them whom I reserve. It says, that the, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for and there shall be no. I would love it if people couldn't remember the stuff I've done that I shouldn't have. What an awesome God. But in Jude, verse 9, I need to tell you a chapter because there's only one chapter in Jude. But verse 9 of Jude says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but instead said the Lord rebuke you. Satan wanted the body of Moses. Now, wouldn't you like to know why? How many would like to know why? I've been to Bible college. I learned how to study scripture. I want to find out why did Satan want the body of Moses? Who wants to know why he wanted the body of Moses? Well, I spent a long time looking at it. I had no idea for sure why he wanted the body of Moses. But I do know enough about the devil. To know that he didn't want the body of Moses to help somebody else live for God. Right. If I'm imagining, I'm imagining he would get up in front of the people of God and say, hey, you see this body? This is a guy that told you he's going to go into Canaan. This guy said he was going to lead you into Canaan. And look here, he never made it. He died. He's dead. Wow. God's not going to do what he said he'd do for you. He, he, he's a bluffer. Yeah. Let me go ahead and tell you about Satan. If he tells you what he's going to do, He's already done all that he can do, and now he's bluffing. Right. You're going to read Job. As soon as he got permission to do anything to Job, he did everything he could, then showed up and bluffed and said, I want to do more. Right. But he's already done all he can. Right. Uh, and he didn't want to encourage somebody who was struggling. And, and then he said, uh, this one, I'll read this passage a couple of other verses. He said, the, the, today's English version says, when they argued about who would have the body of Moses, Michael did not dare condemn the devil with insulting words, but instead said, hey, the Lord rebuked him. Now the message said he wouldn't dare level him with a blasphemous curse, but he said, no, you don't. God will take care of you. So if I'm reading this scripture right, the archangel Michael didn't feel like he had the right to bring a railing accusation against the devil. If we can't accuse the accuser, we certainly don't have the right to accuse anyone else. I love the message paraphrase because when Satan's trying to dispute uh, with Michael over something God buried, Michael says, no, 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 you don't. You're trying to trap me here. You're trying to drag me into that. I didn't bury it. It ain't my job. And too often we try to do the Lord's job and fight his battles. We need to do ourselves a favor and let the Lord do his job. He's really good at it. He's a lot better at it than I am or you are. And sometimes we go boldly where angels fear to tread. Let me say it this way. If God has placed something under the blood, right. no one, including you, has the right to drag it back out from under the blood. Satan is always going to be there to accuse. Revelation 12 and 10 said the accuser of our brethren. He, he, he's accusing but before God, day and night. He is not going to give up on trying to trip you up. He's not going to stop trying to, to hurt you. And he's always going to hit you at your weakest point. That's right. He knows you. Right. He's going to try to tempt you. He's not going to tempt me right. with a cigarette. Right. I, I, I grew up with asthma. I took one puff off of a cigarette when I was about eight or nine years old. We was at the funeral home. Those of you from around Morton know where Otten Lee is, and there's a bunch of us kids out there. Somebody threw one down that was still lit, and we dared each other who would do it. Man, I don't know if I drew the short straw, it was just the dumbest one there. <laughs> but I picked it up and I took one puff of that cigarette, and I coughed and coughed and coughed and I coughed. Why in the world would anybody ever want to put one of these in their mouth? But you know what? Just because that's not my struggle, right. don't mean it's not real for somebody else. Right. 
Let, let me help some of you elders here. In 2022, there's a lot of you elders that have never once ever questioned your sexual orientation. I've never struggled with knowing that I'm a man. And I'm only attracted to women. But just because it's not real for me, doesn't mean we don't have teenagers that have grown up in a culture we didn't grow up in. A couple of weeks ago, we had a young man who wanted to meet with our youth pastor. Talked to him about a struggle. My wife was just devastated over that struggle. And I said, you know what I was with? That wasn't available. We didn't have to struggle with that stuff. We couldn't get a hold of it. But the devil, I, I hate to say this, and say, poor Sister Sue corrects me every time I do, but he, he's, he's really good at being a devil. That's right. He's really good at tripping people up. He's miserable, and he wants to trip anybody up, but he don't care how he trips you up. Uh, and so uh, he, he's going to tip me with a buffet ball or something like that. He's, he's going to look at what, where my weak point is. Right. Ladies, uh, he probably, I, I used to say this with boldness, I mean, you may not care, but he's probably not going to tempt you with pornography. But if he can get you to read a romance novel that describes it, that's just as tripped up right. Right. as what's driving a man to the side. Right. Men, I, I can't say this was a bus boat, because he, he is less likely to tempt you with gossip. But if he can, he'll trip you up with that right. and get you going. Paul said, I'm persuaded that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, uh, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. That's right. And, and I'll just point this out. The Bible says don't add to the word. I'm not adding, but I, know, I do notice that there's one thing that's missing there. Yeah. He doesn't mention your past. Right. And so the word tells us, and I'm closing already, that, that God buried Moses. Satan wanted the body of Moses, but he was withstood by Michael the archangel. I do know that Moses represented the past and that Satan loves to use the past, but here's the point of my message today. Satan could not dig up what God buried. That's right. So I'm here with a simple title and a simple message today. If you've got something that keeps coming up, keeps cropping up, you've been buried, you've been trying to get rid of it, you've been trying to, to, to forsake it, you've been trying not to talk about it, I'm here to tell you today, yes. let's flip the script. Yes. It is biblical for you to repent. Repent simply means to change, turn directions, go the other way. Right. Uh, it, it's up to you to forsake your sin. And I've always thought well, you need to bury your sin. But I, I'm here to change that today. You need to let God bury you. Yeah. When I was a young minister, and I guess I still am in some respects, but uh, there was someone that came to me and they wanted to be baptized again. They were backslidden. Um, and I was in the middle of explaining why there's no need to ever be baptized more than one once. And I felt to check in all of those. If your pastor preaches is different, you, he's right, I'm wrong. But in this one case, and it's the only case I know of, where I'm going to rebaptize somebody, the Lord revealed to me what had happened. This young lady had been almost forced to have an abortion by her grandparents. And she didn't want to admit that she had done that or say that she had done that, but the Lord revealed that to me and said she doesn't have the faith that she can forgive herself for that. She's got enough faith in the waters of baptism that it'll help her forgive herself. And I said, you know what? We can just bring you, bring your mom here. We can just go have a small baptism. She came out of the water speaking in tongues. We let the past make us feel unworthy to be used. And we don't feel qualified to do what God's called us to do. And there's people in this room that you got a call of God on your life. But the enemy's been successful in making you think it will never happen because of your past. You're the one I'm preaching to today and say, let God bury. Praise. If you've got bitterness or you've got resentment over something that was totally not your fault and it wasn't that you had nothing to do with it, nothing you could control, but it's still there. Again, the Bible says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your Father, uh, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Yeah. I vividly remember 
when your pastor was on the radio talking about these verses and a guy called in and said, you mean to tell me that if somebody breaks into my house and shoots my wife and kids, I got to forgive them? He said, yes, sir. He said, I can't believe you'd say that. He said, it's not me saying it. It's the Bible saying it. It's God. Jesus said this. And, and people got all upset. No, God would never expect you to do that. But he would. Yeah. Now, I hope that never happens to any of us. I hope we don't have to. But if you live long enough, you're going to have things happen to you that are totally wrong, that are totally not your fault. Right. Totally someone else's fault. you got to forgive them. you got to let it go. Again, you've heard this, but harboring bitterness or anger is like drinking poison and expecting the one you're angry at to get sick. Right. That's right. Uh, there was one lady. They lived to be 105, and they were interviewed her, and they said, hey, what's the secret to long life? She said, don't have any enemies. They said, wow, you don't have any enemies? She said, not a single one. They said, how did you accomplish that? She said, I outlived them. But you don't have to outlive your enemies. You can release them today of whatever it is. They're doing. It's not worth it. When I think of the goodness of God, when I realize how many times he's forgiven me and how many times he's done things for me, it's not worth holding anything. But God gave me this message. Uh, uh, I, I was in Houston, Mississippi, and praying for a message for that church. And I was staying in the evangelist quarters, which was right above the foyer of that church. And they just insisted that my whole family come with me. And the five of us stayed in a tiny evangelist quarters with a, a, a I think, a full or queen size bed and a couch. Uh, and it was tight, and I was praying, God, oh, give me a word for this church. And I had a dream that night. I got this message and started making all these notes, thinking, man, I'm going to help somebody in this church. And I went to bed that night, my whole family in the same room with me, and I had a dream. And in that dream, I was having a confrontation with another minister who had offended a friend of mine. I was not even involved in this offense, but I had become offended because this minister was in the wrong what he had done to this other person. And I was wanting him to go be man enough to say, I'm sorry I was wrong and it would all be better. And I had gotten offended with that guy. And God gave me this message and woke me up in the middle of the night with a dream saying, you got to let it go. And I thought I had, but every time I'd see him, I'd remember that old feelings and how he had done someone else wrong. And how, I'd go, man, I can't believe he would be mad enough. I love your pastor because he's genuine and real. If he messes up, he's mad enough to say, hey, sorry, I messed up. Forgive me. I'll try to do better. And I think that's the way we all go through life, but everybody don't think that. But even though they don't do it right, don't give us the right to hold that against them or to be bitter towards them. And so in the middle of the night, before I preached this message, I had to have a prayer meeting to say, God, I'm sorry. I thought I'd forgiven him. Help me to release and remove him. And now I haven't forgot it. But I can honestly say every time I've run into that person since, I've never had to deal with it, ill feelings toward him or that. So I'm going to preach some, to somebody today to let God bury it. When Satan, our accuser, comes around, and he's continuing with you. And he's wanting to dig something up. You say, hey, no, 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 wait a minute. That's not my business. I gave that to God. I ask him to bear it. Say, oh, no, you don't. I'm not going there. I, I don't even know where it is anymore. And I, I, I'll close, close with this. And I want to open these altars. There was somebody that had, had a past that they couldn't forget. And they had talked to me multiple times about that past. And um, I, I preached this message to, and they heard it, and they, they, they told me they were going to give it to God. And it was about five years later, they came back to me and said, you remember that I tried to talk to you about? I said, yeah. They said, this is unreal. And they said, I, I still remember that I did those things. I said, but until I asked God to bury it, I couldn't forget details. Now it's like just a vague past memory that I know there's no guilt, there's no nothing 
associated with it because I, and I, I've forgotten and it doesn't collect me, it doesn't haunt me anymore. And the only different thing they did was say, okay, instead of just trying to get past it and live long enough to outlive it, I want to give that to God today and let him do it. So I don't know exactly who I'm talking to, but I can't preach to all of us today. But if there's something in your past, something in your life, something, maybe it's vivid and you felt it the moment we started talking about it today, or maybe it's 30 years old and it still gives you problems, or 50 years old it still gives you problems. Would you just take that today and bring it to the altar and say, okay, God, I've been trying to bury this and it keeps coming back to the surface. But today, I want you to bury it and I pledge to you that the next time the enemy tries to trip me up with it, I'm going to say, wait a minute, I took that out of my hands. In August of 22, I gave that to God and said, okay, God, I want you to bury it and I don't want to know where it is. I don't want, even if someone else brings it up, I'm going to say, oh, don't do that. Yeah, that's, that's in God's hands. That's God's business. There, there's things I've done that I remember that I've done. But if I believe this work and believe that he won't remember my sins anymore and believe that he removes them as far as the east is from the west, then I am insulting God when I drag them back up. When pastor says, hey, would you consider doing this ministry? I'd love to, but I disqualified myself 25 years ago and I can't do that. If I believe this work, I can give it to God and say, okay, it's like it never happened. It's like it never took place. Is there anybody that would join me around this altar today and they sing whatever they sing and say, God, maybe, maybe you need to share this word with a friend that just can't get over something in the past. But let's give it to God today and say, God, I want you to be here. I, I want to give it to you and let you take it. And I don't want to ever have to worry with it again. I don't want to have to let it drag me down again or make me feel negative. God, if I'm holding anything against anyone, let me give it to you, God. I've tried to bury it, but when I see them, I still remember the offense. God, let me give that to you and me, God. Lord, I want you to bury it. I don't ever want to drag it back up. I don't ever want to remember it again. God, I want to place it in your hands and tell you, don't even tell me what you did with it. God, you get rid of it. In Jesus' name, would you give it to him right now? Lord, you know us. You know the end from the beginning. You know the number of the hairs of our head. You know which one is affected, God. Lord, you're concerned about our emotional details. You're concerned about what's keeping someone from being totally victorious in you. God, let us be willing to hand it to you today and let you take control. Let you remove it from our lives, remove it from our thoughts, remove it, God, from our emotions in Jesus' name. Let us be what you call us to be. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Yes, God, yes, God, yes, God. Hallelujah. I want to Jesus. I Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, to you.